thank you those of you joining us online before we dive in as you saw we're looking at uh, God is a promise keeper I want to just celebrate first of all that last week we had 31 people agree to take a test drive in ministry opportunities and serving let's celebrate that thank you so lots of opportunities pray that you'll consider seriously consider prayerfully consider how God may want to love others through you. We contribute our time, our talent, and our treasure. So invite you to uh, check out some of the opportunities in the lobby. As well, this Friday, as you heard Haley talk about our Fall Fest, this is Party with a Purpose. And the reason that we say that is because we hope that you'll invite your friends. We have people here today, their first exposure to Christianity was coming to Fall Fest. So they've met other Christians that love Jesus, and they uh, dove in not long after that. One of them is a deacon today. He's uh, serving with me. In fact, uh, he's my sidekick today. So grateful for Eric and his family. And uh, his first exposure to Crosspoint was at Fall Fest. So you never know how God may use you. Let's go to God's Word. You ready? Let's uh, get your copy of God's Word, if you would. We'll read some of these on the screen, but... I hope that uh, you will pull up your electronic copy or a legit Bible. Just kidding. <laughs> Exodus 19, verse 3. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Exodus chapter 20, and we'll read some of these out loud. I've abbreviated here just for the sake of time, but encourage you to go back and read the whole thing. Exodus chapter 20, we know this section as the Ten Commandments. We'll read those together in just a moment. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Here we go. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself Amen. This is God's word. So some time ago, my wife uh, found out that there was a concert not too far from here with Earth, Wind, and Fire. And she's an Earth, Wind, and Fire fan, and I am too. So don't judge me. A little bit of September. In September. Do you remember? Come on. Do you remember? Can I get a witness? So we, we got the tickets, and there are, you know, thousands of people converging into this arena, and, the, you know, those long lines, you're thinking, am I going to miss the first part? There's that tension of trying to get in, and so we're waiting. We're like hundreds of people back, and as we get closer, think, all right, we're almost there, and you can see the security personnel kind of managing the lines, and they're looking and watching, and I see this family come in from the side. Yeah come in from the side and one of them starts talking to the security agent kind of distracting him and just subtly the whole family just kind of moves in like we belong here and you can feel the tensions rise from all of us who have been waiting the murmurs line jumpers rule breakers how do I know because I was one of them I was like where is justice when you need it you know isn't that like us? We want justice when it serves us well, but if we're on I-270 and we're in a hurry, we don't want justice. We want, to, we want the exception to the rule. You don't understand. I'm in a hurry. I deserve this. What's the way around the rule? 
I was, uh, I was, a few months ago, I was struggling with my voice, so I went to the doctor, see what I could do to change some things, maybe, to, so I wouldn't have those struggles, and the doc said, well, Sean, one of the ways you can really take care of this is to give up coffee. So, okay, well, I'll try that. I tried it for about five days. I said, there must be another way. <laughs> Can we get around this? You know, I'm the exception to the rule. You don't understand how important coffee is to me. That's the way we are when it comes to rules and commands. It's really important for us to kind of consider this as we, as we consider the Ten Commandments. We did a series some time ago, earlier this year, on the purpose of the commandments for Christians. I encourage you to go back because we can't unpack all of that today. But there have been debates about whether or not the Ten Commandments apply to us and how should they apply to us as Christians because we're people of grace. We're not saved by the law. We're saved by grace through faith. So does any of this matter? And those are important questions. Other people have tried to decide, is there any place for the Ten Commandments in society today? Should they be in government property and so on? All those all those conversations are important, but so I ask somebody who should know, and that's AI. <laughs> so AI on my computer is called Copilot, and so I ask AI, I so said, what are the Ten Commandments today that most people would agree with? So it shot out a list, and these were the top three. Respect all life, be honest, practice kindness. So let's just stop right there over the kindness. How are we doing with that as a world? Is the world getting kinder? Come on. I, I don't, I'd give us a, a D, C minus. I mean, it doesn't seem to me that we're getting kinder. So I, so I asked AI, I said, it seems to me that these rules are arbitrary. In other words, what is the authority behind these? Which AI said, that's a great question. And proceeded to give me a word salad paragraph about why this is important, why she would, we should listen, why we need to listen. Take that off the screen. They're not listening to me anymore. They're watching to see what AI said. The, the problem is this. The problem when it comes to rules and commands in life is that, as AI said, well, these are generally accepted. In other words, there is another commandment, secret commandment, that most society is governed by, and it's this one, be true to yourself. And here's the problem, is that when be true to yourself comes against be kind, or don't jump the line, or don't speed, what wins out? Be true to yourself. In other words, I'm the exception to the rule. Surely there must be a way besides giving up coffee. This is the way we think, and it's so inbred into our society, we don't even think about it. It's so baked into our experience that we judge rules by, how does this apply to me, and does this work for me? Because I must be true to myself. This is, this is so important as it comes to the commands that God gives in the Ten Commandments. We've been looking at God as a promise keeper, how he made covenant with Adam and Eve, made covenant with Noah, made covenant with Abram who became Abraham and said, look at the stars, I'm going to make a great nation, you're going to have a child. And Abraham believed it. It was credited to him as righteousness. And God said, one day your children are going to go into slavery. You're going to be 400 years in a strange place. And, it, and it's going to happen. But this one child becomes a nation who now when we look at Exodus, where we are today, this nation is called Israel. That's where we are in this story of God's love and his covenant with Abraham. And God says, you saw what I did to Egypt. You saw the plagues. And this very important line, you saw how I carried you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. 
What is God saying? He's saying, we're in relationship. And what I'm about to say to you when it comes to the commandments I'm going to give you are based on that. In other words, Israel belonged before he asked them to behave. Israel, you belong to me. I brought you to myself. Now, therefore, I am going to give you some terms to our relationship, just like in every aspect of life, every human connection has some terms to it. Some people say, well, love is love, and it shouldn't have any rules. You don't believe that. Just let that lover cheat on you, and you'll find out whether or not you have rules or not. Every human relationship, so especially when it comes to children and our children's ministry, we have rules at Crosspoint. Why? Because we love you and we love your children. So we don't let just anybody serve in children's ministry. We might let them mow the lawn, but we're not going to let them with the babies unless they've had a background check. Make sense? Yeah, I think it was Josh McDowell who said that rules without relationship equals rebellion. Relationship without rules equals chaos. Relationship plus rules equal love. Every relationship has terms. And, and this is what God is going to do with the commandments. The law and the commandments weren't given so they could belong, as I said, but because they belong. Here are the terms of the relationship. God gives this magnum opus, if you will, of his law, these ten, and he would go on to amplify those and how, how they are to be an example of God's love for his people and an example of primarily of his character. This is who I am. I don't cheat on people. Therefore, I'm asking you not to cheat on people. I don't covet, so I'm asking you not to covet. I love you, so love me with all your heart. So love one another. You see, this is God's character that is amplified in the Ten Commandments. So we ask as New Testament believers, if this is true, what is the purpose of the Ten Commandments for the Christian? What about grace? Great question. So we're going to unpack some of that. I want to thank Dr. J.D. Grew and many others that I was studying this week who just had really insightful things to say. But one of the things that stuck out to me as I'm reading some of these guys much smarter than I am, who would say something like this, the Ten Commandments weren't given as a ladder to heaven, but rather given as a response to the truth that we belong to God. And so they would say something like this, the Ten Commandments are not a way to get God to love you, but they are a gift from God to us as a map, a guardrail, and a mirror. God's commandments are, first of all, a map to the flourishing life, a way. This is where I want you to go. I want you to be my people in the earth, Israel. I want to demonstrate my kindness, and I want to give you these commands as a way to the blessed life. God says this is a way to flourish. There is God's way, and then there's my way. God's way of relationship, my way of relationship. God's way of raising kids, my way. So we've got this in so many aspects of our life. Because that God says, I carried you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself. Therefore, you were slaves, and now you aren't. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, remember the Sabbath. Why? Because slaves don't get a day off. So now that you're not slaves, Israel, I want you to take one day a week where you remember that you're free and you belong to me. And I'm God and you aren't. From the dawn of creation, God put this rhythm in motion that God created the worlds in six days and then took one day to celebrate. And God says, now, 
as a reflection of who I am, I want you to practice that. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with this way of living that leads to a flourishing life? I've told you guys, many of you, about my experience with Sabbath, of learning to practice this. I remember early in ministry, I was working seven days a week because I thought, hey, that's what pastors do. You don't get it. I mean, if a lot of people, Sabbath is Sunday for you and you take the day off to do whatever you want, not me. It's work day for me. So I thought, well, that's just the way my life is. And I was sitting with a friend of mine, an older pastor, and we were at the Blue Springs Cafe. I don't know if you've ever been there, the home of the Mile High Pie. And we were sitting there eating that family-style dinner and chatting about different things, and he stopped and he looked at me and said, Sean, tell me about how you're practicing Sabbath. Well, you know, I'm a new pastor and I'm really busy, and uh, I kind of take a little bit of time off on Friday, sometimes a little bit on Monday. And I said, yeah, so I, I don't really do that. Man, I thought he was going to come over the table. He got up on his forearms and leaned over the table. He said, Sean, you think you're smarter than God. God took a day off, and you can't take a day off. You're going to burn out. You're not going to be good for anybody if you don't learn to do this. Promise me you're going to learn to practice Sabbath. And I did what any smart guy would do at that point. I said, yes, sir. And I started doing it. I started practicing. I started, like, turning off the computer. 24 hours, don't touch the computer. Do something else. And surprise, surprise, sermons didn't get worse. They actually got better. I know some of you are debating that, but hey. <laughs> I started having a clearer mind. I started enjoying life more. I thought, man, this really works. And notice what he didn't say. He didn't, my friend didn't say, you better stop breaking the commandments. God's going to get you. You're going to break out with little yellow sores on Monday morning. No, his point was, you're missing it. You're missing the flourishing life. Oh, how many of you guys and gals, I talked to one this morning, she said, that's me, workaholic, I can't stop, I love to work. I said, well, I'm not applying guilt here, but you're missing out. You're missing out on a blessing because this is, this is God says, this is the, the way, this is the way of worship. This, to take one day a week, take 24 hours, and remember that you aren't God. You're not in control. Take 24 hours to say, I'm just going to play. I'm going to worship. Enjoy my kids. Relax. How would that change your life? God says, this is, this is the way. I know some of you still get mad when you go to Chick-fil-A on Sunday. And you realize they aren't open. But I'm glad there's at least one company that's trying to take a day off. God's laws are a map to the flourishing life. Happier life, happier marriage, happier sense of being. Not only that, God's commands are a guardrail from destruction. A guardrail. This time of year, one of the best things you can do to worship is to take a drive. See the fall colors. This is a picture from the Blue Ridge Parkway. One of my favorite places to go in fall. I haven't been there in several years, but the colors are magnificent in the mountains, Blue Ridge Mountains. But there's something else I'm really grateful for when I'm taking this drive, that guardrail. I don't care how good of a driver you are. I know some of you go, I don't need no guardrail. I'm a good driver. I ain't riding with you. No. I want a guardrail. Because on the other side of the guardrail is danger, a fall, destruction. And when we look at God's commands, sometimes we can say people who don't know the bit about God's inviting you into relationship, they just look at it. 
God's just trying to keep us from having fun. Look at a law like a commandment that says, don't commit adultery. Well, why? Do you know anybody that's suffering as a result of somebody's adultery? Do you know any broken hearts? Maybe you know broken bones, but I've sat in rooms trying to talk to somebody in their 30s and 40s, still feeling abandoned because of a parent who walked out. God knows that on the other side is destruction. He's saying, I'm, I'm trying to keep you safe. Contrast that with a couple of weeks ago, a memorial for our previous pastor, Roy Gerald, 93 years old, went to be with Jesus. In the 40-something years that I knew him, I never saw a hint of immorality when it comes to his sexual life. He never talked about women like they were objects. What a legacy. What a faithfulness. And that, that's, in our, that's in our staff and our church. What a legacy he's given to his children and to me that I can stand here today and say, he finished well. Don't you want that? God says his commands are like a guardrail. Not only that, they are like a mirror that reveal our need for a savior. Mirrors, we don't like them. We love them, we don't like them. If you're a teenager, you like them. Anybody over 40, you're like, has it really come down to this? This is, this is not pretty. Or you say, oh, I don't look too bad. Or like a friend this morning said, you look tired. No, I just said, no, it's called old. That's what it is. <laughs> but mirrors reveal the truth. So in, the, in, our, in our ready room, Henry, give me a hand here. In our ready room in the back, the church has given the pastors a gift. It's called a full-length mirror. <laughs> Why do they give people getting ready to come out here a full-length mirror? Come on, talk to me because we want them to know the truth before they come out. So you can see, I know a lot of you are looking, you're like trying to avoid looking here. Does this make you feel better? To say? <laughs> because mirrors don't lie. They tell the truth, whether you like it or not. When I was a teen, I had the thing that afflicts a lot of teenagers. I had Mount Fuji, Mount, other Mount, Fuji's on my, and I get up in the morning and there'd be one on my nose. It's like, where did that come from? A zit, the size of a crater. It's not fair. I was like, it looks like leprosy. And so I didn't know, I didn't know, I don't know what it is now, but back then, the secret sauce was Oxy 10, maximum power. I was like, save me Oxy 10. <laughs> I look and I see the blemishes. Save me, oxy ten. This is what the law is meant to do, God's commandments. That we look in it and it says, remember the Sabbath. Oh, God. I'm not doing good there. You shall not covet. How are you doing with that? You shall not want what your neighbor has. I know some of y'all aren't doing very well because I've been at wedding receptions with you in the buffet line. When you have skipped out of the buffet line and you went early to the dessert table because you didn't want to sit down at that table when your neighbor has that chocolate fudgety, fudgy thing and you got tapioca pudding and you started coveting that chocolate, don't look at me so holy. You know I'm talking to you this morning. But we start looking. We start comparing our life to theirs on social media. Their vacation, their kids, their house. How do I know? Because I'm human too. 
Every time I go to a church that has a lot of things, I have to decide. Am I going to be grateful and happy when I come home? Or am I going to go, where's mine? So that, not long ago, I went to church. Amazing campus. It was so beautiful. Just stunning. And I was just, wow, that's amazing. Look at that. What a gift. Man, God has blessed y'all. But on the way home, I just, just a little tiny voice. Just in my head. I wonder, I wonder if God sees us. Haven't I been faithful? And I, and I felt that and I was like, I see this in God. And I know that that's not healthy. No, I was talking to the Lord about it. And it wasn't an audible voice. But my friends, some of you, I think, understand that when God speaks, you know it. And it was one of those moments I was praying. I said, God, I don't like the fact that I'm, I, I want to be happy for them. But there's part of me that's not happy. I want to be happy. And, and I have to just be, I'm being honest with you, God. Some days I go, I know you're faithful, but what about me? Haven't I been faithful? And I, and I heard that distinct impression. It wasn't audible again, but just that it was like, oh, I knew it was God. He said, Sean, do you think I'm able to bless them and bless you at the same time? Or do you think my resources are limited? It's like, Oh, if God blesses them, there's nothing left over. Isn't that the way we are? And God's saying, I, I am so generous. And, and will you trust me with what you have? But I look into the law and I go, God, I'm, I see my little gods. I see the ways that I create little idols out of success or houses or stewardship or or more people getting baptized, even good things, but I make it like my own little idol. And I look into the law, and I see, oh, I need mercy. God, save me. I need a Savior. And that is what it's meant to do, my friends. Thank you, Henry. That God wants us to look into the law of God and say we need a Savior. Thank God it's a map. Thank God it's a guardrail, but it's also a mirror where we fall short. So you know when God created the two commandments, he told Moses to take how many tablets of stone? Two. Why do you think he did that? Was it because he would run out of room? Was God like, make sure you bring two because my handwriting's really big? No. In ancient covenants, they had two copies of every, just like we do. You have your copy and you have the other party's copy. And God had two. He had one for himself and one for the people. And he told Moses to put this where? In the Ark of the Testament, the Ark of the Covenant that represented God's presence. Under the mercy seat. Why? Because he knew they would need mercy. So God said, once a year, the high priest is going to go in to the presence of God. I'm going to communicate with him. That's face to face. And the priest is going to represent the people to God and say, God, we failed. We haven't kept your commandments perfectly. He's going to sprinkle the lamb's blood on the mercy seat. And then God's going to say, it's okay. I forgive you. You belong to me. And he would go out and he would say, may the Lord bless and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you because he has forgiven us. And my friends, this is what happened in the cross of Jesus Christ. That mercy and truth came together. And we come to the cross and we say, God, I have failed at your commandments. And God says, I've got enough mercy for you because of the blood of the cross. Oh, my friends, we need a Savior. Because we look into God's perfect law and we go, I'm not doing very good, God. Have mercy on me. I'm coveting. I'm, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm worshiping success. Have mercy on me, oh God. That's the point. 
as God knows that, he wants us to come to him, and he's so generous. His mercy endures forever. Oh, my friend, imagine if we could get this in our heart, if we could look at God's commands and say, I trust it, it is God's way. It is the map to the flourishing life. It is a guardrail from destruction. It is a mirror that points me to my need for a Savior. Imagine how that would change our hearts. Imagine how it would change the world. Imagine a church full of people who would not be coveting. Imagine a church full of people who would say, I can take a day off and worship and play and enjoy my family and do things I don't normally do and remember I'm not God. Imagine how that would change us. I think it would be beautiful. I think it would look like a people who God could say, look at my people. Look how they shine. Look how they're different than the culture. Look how they aren't in the rat race of life, but they're trusting me. I think it would look like my friend Mary Mann. Mary was a member of this church for just a short time. Here's a picture from our July picnic. She loved that hat. Jesus is my boss. Mary found out that our four-year-old classroom needed some help, and she told Haley, our director, I can do that. And Haley said, oh, no, we'll, we'll find somebody. She said, no, I can do it. She got in there with the four-year-olds and just had a blast. She didn't take herself seriously. Wasn't, I think it was the same day she got on a motorcycle with Trent and one of the guys in our church. That's Mary. So Mary lived like Jesus was her boss. She trusted him. She believed that what God gave her and what God did for her was good. So she had a prayer. We found out one of her prayers was, I don't want to die alone. She's in her 80s. So she went to retreat, ladies' retreat, and after a night of dancing and worshiping and loving her friends, she walked into the arms of mercy for real, and God met her. And I believe he said, well done, good and faithful servant. Not because she kept the commandments perfectly, but because she tried, and when she failed, she said, Lord, have mercy. Jesus, you're my boss. I'm going to live like that's true. Oh, God, give us more merry men. 20-year-old Mary Mans and 30-year-old and 40-year-old and 80-year-old Mary Mans who trust the Lord with their life completely. Don't you want to live like that? Do you want to live like Jesus is your boss? I'd like us to pause right here because I'm praying that God is dealing with you just he has, as he has with me. So I look into his laws and Realize I'm in covenant with him. I belong to him. And so, yes, there are rules and commands, but I, I need to see them as not as a burden, but as a blessing. John the Beloved said that his commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. They're a gift. They're a blessing. Hear that today. And I just, I, I'd like to just take a few moments in the silence praying that God would speak to you. He's here. He loves you. In what ways is the Lord asking you to obey his commands? Say, trust me. My way is good. Just listen to his voice for a moment. God, our Father, we thank you that mercy and truth came together in Jesus Christ. That you are the mercy seat. We come to you 
our great high priest, Lord Jesus Christ. And we let you know how we failed, how we've fallen short. We plead for mercy and we say, save me, O oh God. We thank you that you're good and faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pray that that's happening right now. People in this room, people at home, coming to the great high priest with confidence, to find mer mercy in the time of need. There may be some in this room, some watching, that you've yet to make Jesus your boss, if I can say it like that. But God, I, I trust you. Your ways are good. Don't always understand. I trust you. You would cross the line of faith today and say, Jesus, be my master. I believe. I believe you are Lord. Maybe uh, some men in this room, I th I'm sure there are, have been giving in to the covetousness in pornography, wanting what you don't have. Pray you would see, as we sang earlier, Jesus is enough. Trust him. People in this room that God is dealing with you about the way you never take any time, no 24-hour period to shut off life. People that you're angry with, that God says, love your neighbor. I'll give you the capacity. As, as the Lord deals with you, I pray that you just surrender to him. He is enough. So, Lord, we humble ourselves before your word and before you, thanking you, you that you are merciful and kind. In Jesus' name, amen.